elite an elite uh, troops uh, consisted of 150 pairs of uh, Erastus and Eraminus, uh, and the idea was that they would p- fight for each other with devotion, and they actually proved to be uh, pretty important in the famous ba- Battle of Leftra in uh, 371 BC. Uh, that's when uh, Thebians uh, crushed uh, um, um, Spartan supremacy and defeated Spartans and that's uh, it was an ascendance of Thebes um, over Spartan dominance of the Greece. Um, so this is one of the like famous relations. The other famous relationship uh, was actually described by Plato uh, between uh, uh, Alcibiades, the famous general during the Peloponnesian War, and the philosopher Socrates. Uh, it was uh, actually based on 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 this relationship. Uh, the concept of platonic love was developed. And it is, by the way, described in the uh, uh, w- one of the dialogues called Symposium. Uh, thank you. And then we will do one of the dialogues, and, you know, at, at some point um, in our ancient text part. So anybody else have any questions? If not, okay, let's get into... I, I actually, I do have a question, um, Greg and Zach. And that is, um, you had mentioned that this is, you know, something that it's the um, to to the the younger and the um, and the older older man. Does the relationship continue though through life? I understand the sexual part, maybe until the younger um, male grows a beard. But do they still maintain some kind of mentorship or relationship um, yeah, that's relationship. not sexual in nature? Yeah, relationship continues. They're friends for life, okay. but there, there's no more. You know, the man, you know, chooses to either have a male partner or a female partner, but they don't no longer have to go through the rite of passage. And but they're, you know, friends for life and that continues. So let's say if they're going to be, a, um, you know, chosen into assembly, I forget the name of it. They, you know, they always help each other. They patronage each other and stuff like that. So it was it was non ending relationship. It was just a passage of life and the patronage doesn't stop. And actually, uh, uh, f- um, uh, Aristotle developed the, uh, another concept called the perfect friendship. And as you know, also famously, Alexander the Great had that kind of relationship uh, with Hephaestion, uh, his uh, general. Um, uh, you know, they had this uh, perfect friendship. Uh, they, had, they were about the same age. Hephaestion was a little bit uh, older, but just a few years. Uh, but uh, it was another form. But uh, obviously, after the uh, death of uh, Hephaestion um, in one of the battles, uh, there was a major blow, and Alexander was no, never the same. That's true. I mean, I mean the, the, the other thing is the Greeks themselves had many different wars from love, too. So like the war to arrows. Is more closely associated with desire, what just Greg talked about. It's kind of a different idea of what Aristotle talked about. Um, I guess the other interesting thing in the Erastus and Ramnus relationship, it could be sexual, it didn't have to be necessarily, right? I think the under idealistic circumstances, it, it was not supposed to be coerced. So sometimes it was, obviously, but like it, in, in theory, it shouldn't have been. So, like, the young man would have received education regardless. True. And uh, on also the, the main point is when a father gave his blessings, you know, for his son to join that, all, you know, adult uh, male, what's interesting is he assigned slaves for a son. So if there is an abuse going on, if the, if the son doesn't want to uh, have sex or whatever reason, uh, the slave will step in. They have a right to step in and um, prevent that from happening. So uh, they were protected. Uh, so it, it has to be out of desire. And also what's interesting is, you know, obviously uh, the, the male, uh, in order for them to get to know each other when they first introduce, they go out and they hunt for two, three months, kind of like a honeymoon type of thing. And they do everything and they get introduced and they see how things go, you know, and then he showers them with gifts. It's just like a regular relationship type of thing. So, uh, Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. And um, anybody else have any questions, let me know. Um, so I just want to talk about a little bit about prostitution in Greece, okay? Since we talked about prostitution in Egypt. You know, uh, so everybody knows who Salon is, right? Salon, you know, came up with all this, 
initially democratic you know rules he's also he has been credited with creating uh, first brothels in athens you know uh what he did is he purchased uh, slave women and put them to work in brothels at the prices with everyone could afford what's the best way to deal with a lot of young people running around in athens and the city was growing and they were restless um, is to engage them in, uh, into, uh, I mean, if they don't want to, they want to have sex and there was a disparity men to women, they, we can go to a brothel and uh, Salon solved that issue. Um, so what's interesting is Philemon, who was one of the, uh, you know, writers, writes, highlights that Salonius brothels provide a service accessible to all regardless of income. There are numerous uh, illusions, the price of one oval for a cheap prostitute, no doubt, only for a basic act. Just to give an example, one oval was one sixth of the drachma, and a drachma was uh, a daily uh, salary for the civil worker in Athens. So it was only one sixth of his salary to visit uh, a brothel. So you could go at uh, any point, you know. So that was the assessment of it. So you can go six times in one day, you know. Um, and it's interesting because uh, uh, the Narcissus comedian it, it also talks about uh, you know um, the fragment in his in his uh, in his in this fragment he talks about in the city of Athens there are after all very good looking young things in whorehouses, their breasts uncovered. Strip for action, drone and battle formation by columns. One can select whatever sort of one likes. Thin, fat, squat, tall, sh shriveled, <laughs> young, old, middle-aged. Horse um, name, though, you know, though, I mean, horse drag people into the um, brothels and they name an older gentleman, little father. And they name uh, a younger gentleman, little brother, basically. That's how they refer to that. Okay, so let me know if you have any other questions. So we finish with Greece, um, and we finish with Egypt. Um, and I already had mentioned that it was a regulated prostitution. Um, you know, we'll get to group sex when we get to Rome, but basically, um, we'll talk about it. So ancient Rome. Oh yeah. wait. Wait, but let me let me add a little bit. I mean, there are different types of uh, uh, you may call prostitutes. Uh, uh, there was heteras, which is the uh, high class, um, and they were not necessarily uh, providing sexual um, services. Uh, they were more of a companions. They were uh, allowed to uh, symposiums, which are uh, mostly gathering of men. Uh, and uh, as you know, the most famous one was Aspasia, uh, who was a companion of uh, uh, Pericles in the fifth century BC. Uh, and uh, she was uh, not only just his companion, she was also his advisor. He was very astute uh, about the political situations. Um, she herself uh, was uh, from the Ionia, the city of Miletus. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore uh, kind of had a broader knowledge uh, in Athenian society because she lived in different areas. Um, so that's one. The other one famous was uh, Thais uh, of Athens who were a companion to Alexander the Great uh, at some point. So these are the high level companions that uh, do provide uh, uh, sexual services as well. As a matter of fact, uh, Aspasia uh, and Pericles had their son, uh, Pericles the Younger, and uh, 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 wh when the plague happened at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, um, the Pericles' uh, sons from his wife, uh, he had three, they all died, uh, and that was the only son he actually had to change citizenship laws introduced and kind of supported in order to make his uh, uh, son Pericles the younger legitimate uh, uh, and the uh, citizen of Athens because uh, originally he changed the laws that um, uh, the father was not enough but now he changed it back 
and, and, and his son uh, became a general during the Peloponnesian War. Unfortunately, uh, he was executed uh, at the end of it. That's another story. So Thais of uh, Athens uh, uh, is another uh, famous companion to Alexander. So this is the Heteris, uh, described also in Plato Dialogues uh, as, a, as a guest to uh, symposium. And there was a lower end prostitutes, the, the ones that probably Solon originated, and they were called Pornai. Uh, I guess uh, the word pornography comes from that. Uh, and uh, they usually uh, operated uh, out of brothels. Uh, uh, a very famous one were in the Piraeus, which was a port. Uh, of Athens, uh, kind of a little bit removed from the city. Uh, and uh, obviously there are a lot of sailors there. So uh, the, this is, was the lo lower end uh, prostitution. Yeah, and uh, to, you know, to, to, uh, to Greg's point that, you know, it's on the slide, that's why I just didn't want to re read it, but also I'm gonna see what the girls who would work part-time as a prostitute, they kind of, you know, worship the Venus and Boidea was a goddess whose festivals included prostitutes engaging in public lesbian activity with one another. But lesbianism was not, um, you know, uh, it, I mean, it was known, but it was not acknowledged. By yeah, uh, actually just uh, saying about that, the, the, the whole word of uh, lesbian comes from the island of Lesbos, uh, where uh, the one uh, probably the only famous one that came to us, a female poet, Sappho, um, who was uh, uh, living in, in, in the capital of Lesbos, organized the uh, uh, philosophy school for women. And, uh, and supposedly the women were isolated and uh, there were a lot of rumors you know, it's all kind of vague that they engaged in the, into male to or female to female uh, sexual activities, and that's how the word um, uh, came out, uh, came about. Um, and uh, I actually wanted to say something else. All right, I forgot about that. <laughs> Go uh, ahead. You'll get a chance. I mean, we, you know, we will, we have a we have about another 30, 40 minutes of presentation, maybe less. <laughs> Yes, yeah, she lived um, in the sixth century BC, by the way, Sappho. So now we come to Romans, you know. Um, so what's interesting, uh, and then sorry to have this group sex thing, but uh, we'll come back to that. So Romans, um, the Romans actually, uh, they were off to a good start, you know. In 750 BC, you could think that the, the you know, the sexuality was open for Romans. So what they did is, um, and Greg knows the story better than me, they invited a bunch of Sabians and they raped their women. Sabians were the tribe that lived nearby and Latins were lived in Rome. At that time, it was just a village. They invited a bunch of Sabians and they raped their women because they didn't have any women. Um, and I, 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 I don't know, I pronounce them Sabines, but Sabine, I don't know yeah. what's the right, I, I'm not sure what the right pronunciation is. Yeah, it was also because they had no women, supposedly, uh, under the uh, uh, Romulus, uh, uh, organized the city, uh, uh, built the walls, and uh, th there were only ma a male there, there were very few women, so they, they needed some women, and that's how they invited women from the neighboring tribe of Sabines uh, uh, to the celebration, and then eventually can took I, advantage of them. Can I, can I ask a question as to like further my understanding of of what I'm hearing, it's like right here. So were the uh, Sabians or Sabians uh, like a socially castrated group of uh, people who were designated for whatever social or political reasons, like off to the side where they generally couldn't have women? Or... No, no, no. Sabians was the tribe. It was men and women, it's neighboring tribe. Rome okay. was a settlement. Uh, 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 that was organized on, on the capital in Ki Hill uh, that uh, uh, supposedly it's a kind of a legendary story. Obviously, Romulus is not a historical figure, uh, at least not yet, uh, but uh, uh, he organized uh, the city, start building the walls. Uh, the, the, so it became a walled city. It's called uh, in his name, Rome. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, I, think, I think it was called different at the time when he was there. 
Uh, however, they needed women because they were mostly men that gathered around him and organized it. So the neighboring tribe that had, there was fully functional tribes of Sabines, you know, uh, they invited women from that tribe into the city, uh, you know, for a celebration. There was some kind of uh, ritual and celebration. And eventually, once the, in the middle of celebration, when they drank, uh, they decided uh, to grab those women. Uh, and uh, actually, the idea was not just to have sex with them, but to marry them in a way, to, be, to, to make them their own. They, they choose the women just like forcefully uh, made them their wives uh, start to live with them because they needed to procreate. I mean, that, that, this is the legend, by the way, right? It's not a history, uh, you know, and eventually uh, the story comes that the man from that tribe eventually, uh, you know, came back to reclaim their women uh, because these were their daughters and uh, who knows, wives. Uh, and, and there was a war between Sabians and, and Romans. And uh, well, famously, uh, are you planning to talk about this, uh, Zach? No, no. I, this is the only so, and, and famously what happened I, I, then, I guess. I, I have to ask for my own clarification so I interpret this reasonably. Is this, uh, when you say legend, are we, are we saying mythology or is... Uh, yes, of course. Okay. This is the, uh, uh, yeah, that mythology okay. and legend is the same thing uh, to me, at least. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so what happened is uh, that when they came, there were already uh, uh, like a couple of years passed because they, the Sabian uh, man, uh, I mean, obviously not all women were taken, uh, Sabian men wanted to plan this. It was not easy to take uh, uh, the city with uh, fortifications. Uh, so they planned it, they gathered uh, the, the big troop, the, on the army, and they attacked Romans and they started to fight. So there, there maybe a couple of years passed since, since, since that happened. At this time, a lot of uh, Sabine women were already uh, you know, uh, became wives of, of Romans, uh, and they and they also had children together already. And the Sabine women, apparently, according to the legend, interfered in the fight, and they said, "We don't want, uh, uh, you know, our fathers and brothers to fight with the fathers of our sons." You know, and supposedly they uh, stopped the fight, and uh, uh, and after that, they decided to accept. Uh, uh, Sabine tribe into the city and uh, Sabines actually uh, formed uh, uh, later on uh, one, one of the, uh, uh, you know, part of the nobility, you know, they kind of merged together, but that's how uh, they explain, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Sabines being part of the city. That was the legend how explained that the original Romans and Sabines united as, as, as one people. You know, and uh, we, as we know, the uh, uh, foundation of Rome was considered to be in 753 BC. So we're talking about events that happened in 8th century BC. Yeah, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Um, so th that was. I, the... I was just, I was just going to add something to that, and sure. I guess this is for Kyle. Um, whether it be legend or myth, there's. Um, very famous oil painting called the rape of, um, I guess Sabines. it's the rape of the Sabine, Sabine women. Um, and I think it's in, I guess it's moved around, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's uh, in the National Gallery in Great Britain. Right, I, I'm, I'm just thinking, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it could be this uh, Louis David, uh, the, the painter, I think, uh, French painter, I think, I'm not sure. Thank you guys um, for the clarification. Um, oh, sure, Kyle. Any, anytime, anybody else, any questions, please feel free, you know. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's the first act of, um, you know, Roman act. Second act, uh, as we know, there was Roman kings prior to creating a Roman Republic. And there was, um, you know, this act where sex was implicated first in overthrow of a tyrannical monarchy and establish of republic. 
So they went from the, uh, you know, Roman kings to republic. And due to the fact that then in restoration of the republic, so pivotal to Roman democracy during the former, uh, uh, Virtus Lucretia, a legendary Roman uh, a patron whose fate played a key role in transition from Roman kingdom into Roman Republic, took her own life. So she was raped by this um, uh, Tacinius, um, uh, Titian, you know, uh, and Lucretia became a martyr, uh, basically preserving a sexual virtue, which is called pedicity, right. cost Lucretia and Virginia their lives. So important was pediticia to Roman values, history and society. Later Roman historians like Levy embellished that the legendary women of the past with the sexual mo you know, morals, they insisted their contemporary women would enshrine, basically. So uh, let me show her a picture of, um, uh, this is the where Lucretia is being uh, basically killed by, uh, raped and killed by Tarquinius. And uh, that's when they transferred to the Roman Republic. Um, now, what was the women, you know, women's job during the Roman time, right? Hey, can I just uh, add a little bit uh, to this? Uh, that uh, uh, Lucretia was married to a very prominent, uh, 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 you know, noble uh, of Rome. And uh, supposedly when he arrived, she was still alive uh, on a, a, or dying. And that's when she told what happened to her and uh, as we know the people before die they, they wouldn't create a story right um, uh, unlike uh, Fedra <laughs> you know but um, he believed in her and because of his status uh, all the nobles uh, uh, rebelled against the uh, Tarquini the Proud. Tarquini the Proud by the way was supposedly a, a third king of, of, of the uh, uh, Etruscan uh, dynasty, uh, and uh, and it was a last king, uh, um, uh, and and actually Romans resented uh, um, Etruscans uh, who actually had a lot of influence. It was a superior culture, uh, and uh, so they on, on, uh, were only glad to rebel and 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 actually expel all the Etruscans from the city, and from there on that the date. Uh, uh, is uh, generally 509 BCE. Uh, that's when it happened, supposedly. And, uh, you know, from there on, they organized Republic. And that's where the period of uh, Roman Republic started. Yep. So uh, the women role, I mean, women uh, role was very lopsided in, um, uh, they were basically childbearing machines in Roman society um, and nothing more. They just, you know, bear babies and they didn't really earn any income. And indeed the marriage itself was a lopsided affair. According to the, you know, um, according to the man, women who married should not expect any pleasure or enjoyment. They should tie the knot simply to procreate. Moreover, the silent and compliant and subservient wife was expected to turn a blind eye to her husband's sexual in, in fallacies, in fallacity. Uh, while the man could uh, philander as much as he liked, so long as the mistress was unmarried or with a boy, uh, or with a boy, he was um, over a certain age. Brothels, prostitutes, and dancing girls were considered fair game, as were older males, with one crucial proviso that it was you who did the penetrating. Being passive and being penetrated was considered women's work. Men who submitted were considered deficient in ver, ver means virtue, and virtus, virtue. They were denounced and reviled as effeminate. So if they were penetrated or were engaged in homosexuality, then they were considered effeminate and that was bad for the warrior society of Rome. So the same sex in ancient Rome was thought to be fine for a man albeit with the conditions, but same sex between women was unconditionally um, exec execrated. Lesbian sex often assumed penetration, which was considered man's work. So a woman adopting this role and her submissive recipient were uh, castigated in the equal measure. The, the Latin word lesbian, lesbian woman was a, a 
tri baits or fricatores, those women that you know, rob basically. So they didn't have obviously anything to do it with. So they said they just robbed together. So what's interesting is, uh, you know, the Augustus actually created legalized uh, brothels in Rome. And therefore, it, you know, uh, his legalization kind of exploded the brothels in Rome and not just Rome, you know, um, if you go to any other cities uh, and for example, um, if the city that got uh, by Vesuvius, what's his, what's the name of it? Pompeii. Naples. Pompeii. 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 Naples. Pompeii, Pompeii. Oh, okay. Pompeii, uh, Pompeii had 80,000 um, inhabitants and there was 6,000 brothels in Pompeii. So it was, it was unbelievable, you know, and it was everywhere. So people would, you know, get, you know, obviously that. So it was interesting. By the end, uh, by the end of the Roman Republic, however, illicit and extramarital <laughs> sex was, uh, sex was seen to be damaging and, and rampant. Augustus, the first emperor, noticed this, and although he himself was not averse of whisking off their men's wives at the odd dinner party for a spot of horse to horse, he tried to restore some good old-fashioned family values with larger and successful legislation relating to marriage, divorce, and birth rate boosting. Augustus' sexual activity was, however, easily eclipsed by his wayward daughter, Julia. Let me just look at this girl, Julia. And this girl was something who said to have fornicated on the very podium from which her father, Augustus, had delivered his uh, moralistic legislation. So he's saying, guys, don't, you know, don't have sex with, uh, you know, married women. I'm going to just go to the brothel if you want to do that. But she's fornicating right on the same podium. To Julia, life was a, a beach. Uh, and she said her analogy that, she never took a lover on a board unless her boat was full. <laughs> that is, she was pregnant. So she only had sex with lovers when she was pregnant, rebounded, you know, re rebounded badly. Her father actually exiled her to the remote island of Pandataria off the coast Campania with no humans in it, no, nothing. So she basically died there. And this is a marble statue of Julia. By, by the way, uh, she was uh, married to uh, Augustus, uh, major uh, friend and supporter, Marcus Agrippa, and, and had a number of children from him. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he actually eventually uh, uh, ma married her off to uh, uh, his adopted son, Tiberius. Uh, so she had, uh, against his will, he, he, he forced Tiberius to divorce his current wife, uh, uh, whom he was in love with, but he had he had no choice. So yes, yeah, he, he Augustus actually also, in a way, uh, kind of used her uh, for his um, you know uh, needs. Um, I would say to produce a successor. Um, so and uh, uh, eventually, um, as you know. Um, uh, the Drusus, right? Um, uh, Drusus Germanicus. Um, yeah, he was her son. Yeah. So now we can get to emperors. And there was a story of crazy emperors, right? Um, and, you know, for example, Tiberius, right? I want to keep it. I'm sorry? All right, Tiberius, meanwhile, dressed as a woman who is debauchery on Capri and Caligula, uh, and Caligula sometimes showed up and Bank was dressed as a Venus. Nero, full of remorse after kicking to death his pregnant wife, Papea Sabina, thought out a surrogate who resembled her and found Sporus, not a woman, but a young man. Nero, you know, castrated that man who was an ex-slave and basically walked down the aisle uh, presenting him to be his wife. Sporus joined Nero in bed with uh, Pythagoras, another freedman Nero had married. So there was two men and Nero. Uh, so he was a male orgy who uh, nightly played the role of husband in their uh, toilism. Sporus routinely accompanied Nero decked out as his empress. Nero, who is said to have enjoyed incest with his mother, Ag Agrippa the Younger, starred in the notorious banquets of 
Pegilius, draped in the skins of a wild animal, he would be released from a cage to mutilate orally the genitals of a man and women bound to, uh, bound to the stakes. This guy is crazy, completely out of his name, out of his mind. Caligula, Caligula too. I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing after another. Um, it's, you know, they just basically were doing whatever they wanted. Uh, as it comes to women, uh, let's just go to this picture. Um, there's a famous uh, picture of um, uh, this woman, uh, Messalina, who was an empress to Claudius, okay? Queen of um, Imperial, they call her a queen of Imperial horse. What she did is she dressed up as a, you know, she basically, um, you know, dressed up and changed her name to Lucissa and went to the brothel and had sex with anybody she could, one man an hour. In fact, she had a marathon one time, 24 hour marathon, where she had 25 partners in, 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 in 25 hours for every hour, one man. And she set up some kind of record. Um, so this is a depiction of the naked uh, uh, Empress Messina, who was the uh, Empress to the Claudius. Yeah, just, uh, the, you know, there is a famous book uh, by Robert Graves uh, called I, Claudius, where he describes uh, all of the uh, situations there, uh, and specifically about Miss Alina and how she kept uh, her husband Claudius um, uh, in, in the dark about all of her uh, uh, extramarital affairs. As a matter of fact, she... Uh, got involved, she forced a number of uh, uh, men to have sex with her uh, under the threat that she would uh, complain to her husband uh, about something and they would be killed. Uh, you know, that, that's described in that book. And I also wanted to say that uh, Agrippina, uh, the, the younger, the mother of Nero, uh, she, uh, you're showing Julia, she was Julia's uh, granddaughter she, uh, uh, you know, that's where Julia and Marcus Agrippas that um, uh, I was talking about. That's why the, she was called Agrippina because her grandfather was uh, Marcus Agrippa. Uh, so she was uh, um, a granddaughter of Julia uh, and Marcus Agrippa, Julia, daughter of uh, Augustus and uh, Livia. Interesting, interesting. And I think the most disgusting one uh, he tops it all. He, he takes the, the prize. His name is uh, Alagopoulos, all right? Unspeakably disgusting. So, I mean, for those times. Uh, notorious transgender and divine, bested by gender confusion and depravity. However, he could, he could not be accused of lacking sense of humor. According to the <laughs> sensational Historia Augusta, this is what he writes. He took a last in every orifice of his body, sending out agents in search of a man with a large penises to satisfy his passion. The size of the man's organ often determined the post he was given. He habitually locked his friends up when they were drunk and suddenly in the night let into the room lions, leopard, you know, leopards, leopards uh, bears, uh, superstitiously rendered harmless so that when they woke up, these friends would find at dawn, or worse, during the night, wild animals in the same bedroom as themselves. You know, several of them died of shock as a result of this. Things went further still with this Agabalus, offered huge fortunes to any physician who would give him permanent female genitalia. In the words of Roman historian Cassius Dio, to contrive a woman vagina in his body by means of the incision. Okay. So he was completely you know, out of his mind. And then we just fast forward to 525 AD. We have this Roman Empress Theodora, who is actually uh, considered to be a saint, but who was Empress of Justinian uh, I. We all know Justinian I, who tried to reconquer the Roman Empire back, but he was from the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople, worked in a Constantinople brothel Theodora worked in a Constantinople brothel, performing memes and obscene burlesque. Uh, one of her star roles was a Leda, uh, Leda and Leda and a swan. This involved lying on her back while other actors 
scattered barley on her groin. The barley was then pecked by a geese masquerading as a Zeus, inviting <laughs> fellow actors to uh, cap cap uh, copulate with her on a stage was another Theodoria party pieces. But Theodora was later transformed into a virtual sainthood with her raft of the social reforms, protecting women from physical and sexual abuse and discrimination, enacting what she assumed the position of empress. So that's that's it. That's all my presentation about, guys. Anybody has any questions? Want to I, have a, I have a question. I have actually asked questions and comments. Um, a lot of thuggish men, um, pretty obvious, but also more importantly, where was uh, um, religion at this time, um, i.e. Catholicism, um, Christianity? Christianity hadn't arrived yet. This we're talking about still AD. This was early AD. Like no, no. But if you're talking about Justinian, that that was already Christian. Uh, period. Yeah, that was Christian. Yeah. Because you you know Justinian builds and uh, uh, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Right. Uh, he, he is the one. But when we're talking about the Nero, Nero was considered to be Antichrist because, uh, as you know, he blamed Christians for the fire in Rome. Uh, and, and he then uh, sacrificed the uh, Christians in the, the gladiator game to the animals. They were massively killed. Uh, so he organized the uh, huge prosecution of Christians. So uh, Nero uh, uh, himself died in 68 uh, AD. Uh, so the, the, it's already, but at that time, Christians were prosecuted. As you know, the Christians really became uh, a, an official religion at the time of the Emperor Constantine in the early fourth century AD. Uh, uh, but prior to that, uh, they were gathering force, but there were a number of prosecutions. Famous one, Diocletian, prosecuted Christians at the end of the third century AD. Uh, okay. So there was, yeah, so that, that but uh, all of those emperors, uh, which we talked about the Caligula Nero, that's a really uh, it's a, Christians existed, but they were um, uh, prosecuted uh, severely uh, while um, Justinian period, that, that was already Christian period, and he was Christian himself. And, and I know that um, after the destruction of the uh, Second Temple in Jerusalem, um, the Jews were also forced out. And had any um, migrated to uh, Rome? And yes, not, not in, in mass. No, no, no. In Rome, there was they immigrated. They immigrated through Roman a, a lot. Of course, uh, most of them uh, immigrated uh, to Alexandria, uh, uh, you know, and Antioch uh, in Syria. But a lot of them eventually made it, not right away. But we're talking about like, this is the period of Flavius in 70 AD. Uh, but again, it was only Jews from uh, Jerusalem that were uh, expelled. Uh, the, the rest of the Jews through the country were not. Uh, so, but the number of Jews so ended a, up in Rome. So yeah. it's a small, small group. It, yeah, it was, it's small, it's small group. The, the, the uh, the ultimate uh, ex expulsion of Jews happened uh, in the beginning of the second century AD. I think it's 132 after the uprising of Bar Kokhba uh, with the Kokhba. That's happened at the time of the Emperor Hadrian. Um, so that uh, uh, that then uh, there were very few Jews left after that. But uh, <clears throat> after 70, there was a major expulsion mostly from Jerusalem and areas, uh, some others too, but not the massive, like, uh, like uh, ultimate expulsion. Uh, yeah. And some of them ended up in, 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 uh, in Rome as well. Uh, but... Um, I mean, there was a famous one, Josephus Flavius, that uh, was actually, you know, was a contemporary of the destruction of Second Temple in Rome two particular pieces of interest that, you know, uh, first one he wrote 
the Jewish in antiquity and the Jewish wars, and both of them were to educate about you know the, uh, you know about um, you know a Jewish laws and kashrut laws uh, to uh, to people because there was a lot of Greek sentiment with anti-Semitism, and he also wrote a book called Against Appian. Appian was a Greek um, writer who wrote a lot of anti-Semitic, um, which didn't survive to this day. But we do have the book against Appian that survived from Josephus Flavius that actually talks about defending why the Jews do circumcision, uh, why it's happening, and, and educate non-Jews about the, the different laws on why we kill the animal and, you know, they let blood out and all that stuff, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else, any other questions? Um, if not, Wednesday we have Odyssey, Homer, and let me just, uh, you know, put the schedule up again uh, uh, quickly. And then, um, so uh, like I said, um, the first closest one we have Odyssey. Uh, Paul is gonna present, we have about 15 people already signed up. Then the next day of it, we'll have history of soccer World Cup. And then on the 28th, we have monastic order a Benedictine Dominic, Dominician and Z Jesuits. Anne is going to present that, Anne Boom. Um, and I think we're done for February. And then we have a bunch in, uh, in March. Uh, we have a Napoleon presentation. We have Jewish nature presentation, uh, allegorical. We have Diadochi. We have Conquest of Americas, Florida Expedition, or maybe he'll be supplemented with, um, you know, uh, a rise of fall of Atsekas. Um, you know, we have stateless ethnicities, which we'll talk about Kurds, we'll talk about uh, ethnicities that, you know, have no state, um, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, uh, that's basically it. And um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm also looking for people to add uh, more topics that you guys want to talk about. Like, for example, you know, you can talk about particular subject matter. We're talking about history of ancient weapons. Or we can talk about, you know, Fran France of 1940. Um, you know, somebody offered us to talk about history of American cop on sale. <laughs> Sorry, who's that? <laughs> so this is the schedule and you can find it omnicarta.org, okay? So um, if anybody have no questions, uh, Greg, thank you for helping me. I appreciate that. And um, I will see you uh, next week. And thanks, Lisa. Thanks um for a lot of interesting questions and additions and i'll see you next week we had a long one this we had four presentations this week we're going for we're going for a record wow <laughs> yeah we're growing thanks guys <laughs> no problem. bye guys have a nice one bye all right take care